हेलो एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू डूइंग वेल इफ द ऑडियो विजुअल्स आर क्लियर लेट मी नो आई एम ट्राइंग फ्रॉम माई एंड ऑल्सो टू चेक इफ द ऑडियो विजुअल्स आर फाइन yeah so i think uh, uh, everything is fine and it's working well and uh, i hope i'm audible and visible yeah. to all of you uh, good afternoon eliza and uh, <clears throat> first of all i would like to congratulate all of you for uh, having attempted the inict examination i mean of course one of the toughest examination in the country and uh, if you have attempted the examination if you have taken the examination i think that itself is a very big feat and an achievement by itself and uh, worrying about results is something that you should do later because at this given point of time you have done whatever you could do in this whatever stage of preparation you were and you attempted and you did your best and you are sure that this is what you could do at the end of the day so there's no point in fretting and thinking about you know i wish i could have done this i wish i could have done that so don't fret anything ab about anything at all and uh, if you have done well very good if you haven't there is still you there is still a hope there is still a possibility because we have the neat pg coming up we have the next i nice coming up so don't lose hope and don't feel saddened just that learn the lesson what you have done here and what mistakes you've committed so that you don't repeat them in the upcoming examination and you achieve more possibilities in your future <clears throat> okay so with this uh, uh, let's begin the recall for the inict 2023 so in inict 2023 before we begin the recall let me just tell you what we have uh, on offering for you from the uh, from the unacademy so we have got this offer where we are going to give you a uh, notes we are going to need pg vitals a recorded version where we have all the recorded content of all the 19 subjects and we will give you an extension also of up to 3 months so all of this together is coming on a 20% off on an academy subscriptions so what you pay is very minimal a 12 month subscription costing you just 18000 and 9 month at 17000 and a 6 month at 15000 you could additionally get a 10% off by using the code ent live and you could get another 10% off okay so uh, the next thing that we have is the ultimate next batch which is a concise batch for the next and the neat pg 2024 aspirants so basically when we have recorded version you can go through the recorded content but there's a set of people who would like to have live interactive discussion so which is why we have these live interactive classes this batch has started from 29th of april and the duration is an 8 month batch so we have a live batch going on where we where we are going to give you the recorded content plus 2 month subscription plus the live batch course where we are going to discuss individually on the topics on the subjects and you are going to have an interactive session again you can en enroll to this batch and get an additional 10% off by using the code ent life So with this, let's begin the discussion. So there is a question that says that there is a South Indian patient who is a cattle breeder presenting to you with the complaints of a reddish mass. This is coming out of the nose as shown in the image, and the pathological examination finding is also given below. What is the possible diagnosis? so is this rhinosporidiosis rhinoscleroma rhinophyma or a nasal polyp so sayak uh, doctor yes oh you are right this is a common repeat mcq and mcq that we have done multiple times this is a repeat question i think there is a no scope of doubt on this question because everything that you see from line 1 itself from the first point itself is giving you the answer we see south indian cattle breeder you should think about rhinosporidiosis because it's endemic in south india unlike rhinoscleroma which is endemic in northern part of the country and this is 
caused by an aquatic protozoan that aquatic protozoan is called as rhinosporidium seaberry so this aquatic protozoa is called as rhinosporidium seaberry so this rhinosporidium seaberry is the acquired or the mode of transmission of this infection is via contaminated water so those cattle breeders if they take their cattle for a bath in a pond or or in any water body possibility of contamination happening and the farmer acquiring the infection is there now this aquatic protozoan multiplies in the layers of the epidermis resulting in a red vascular polypoidal mass this is typically present in the vestibule of the nose and it has got a red vascular mass with whitish dots of of the spores on the surface resembling the fruit strawberry so strawberry like mass is something that you should think about the only condition which is rhinosporidiosis histopathology is also very specific where you will see these are the sporangia and inside this sporangia you have got multiple endospores so the presence of sporangia with spores is another definitively diagnosis for rhinosporidiosis so there's no question here rhinophyma is hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands which you see on the nose or potato nose due to uh, it's seen in patients with acne rosacea alcoholics and diabetics it has a specific appearance it's not in the vestibule but on the external nose polyps will present to you as pale masses and usually you will see them in the middle meatus very less often you will see them anteriorly like this and they are not red and vascular they have no predisposition of south and north there is no predisposition of a cattle breeder or any other thing so can't be a nasal polyp also so the diagnosis is going to be rhinosporidiosis i think that's without any doubt now again a very common repeat mcq i will say that this question has occurred even in the last inict examination a very simple question i think everybody every every ent student will be knowing the mnemonic of the correct auditory pathway sequence so you can answer in the chat box which is the correct auditory pathway sequence yes very good the correct pathway for the auditory sequence is e coli ma <coughs> very good so we know that e stands for eighth nerve c stands for your cochlear nucleus o stands for superior olivary complex l stands for lateral lemniscus I stands for inferior colliculus M stands for medial geniculate body and A stands for auditory cortex auditory cortex is present in your superior temporal gyrus now between the cochlear nucleus and the superior olivary complex there is also a body that is called as trapezoid body which helps in conduction so please remember the word trapezoid body can also be given sometimes in the examination you should know it lies between cochlear nucleus and the superior olivary complex okay so i think this is a common question i don't think i have to go into details of it we are good to go okay medico topics we will go little more faster in that situation the third repeat so if you see the third question is also a repeat mcq the first was a repeat second was a repeat the third one is also a repeat what is the likely diagnosis of the image given below is this a ranula is this a mucosal is this ludwig sangina or dermoid cyst okay so i think there is no doubt again on this when you have a cystic bluish swelling in the floor of the mouth you will think of ranula which is nothing but a what is a ranula it is a extra vasation cyst coming from the sublingual salivary gland so it is coming from the sublingual salivary gland presents to you with a bluish cystic swelling in the floor of the mouth dermoids will be in the midline they'll not be present on the side of the midline and uh, ludwig sangina is cellulitis of the floor of the mouth mucosal typically occur with the minor salivary gland and we do not see that in the major salivary gland so that is why the answer is going to be ranula so without wasting any time further let's go to the next question there is an image that was given 
given which showed you some injection or a procedure being done on the medial canthus again this is a repeat this is a repeat of 2020 aims so if you see again the repeat so four questions that we are done so far are all repeat so if you essentially done the INI CT PYQs that would have been more than enough for you to solve all the questions that have come in the exam so what does this image show you does it show you NLD syringing anterior ethmoidal nerve block median nerve block nasociliary block so I'll tell you the difference in 2020 examination when they gave you this question nasociliary was not there in the option as far as my uh, understanding goes when I had taken recall session of 2020 they said that nasociliary nerve was not there in the question which is when the students had to answer anterior ethmoidal nerve as the answer but in this examination they have changed the options they didn't give a direct repeat they have changed the options so whenever they are asking you about any injection or the pedial canthus the first answer that you should think of will be nasociliary block the nasociliary nerve divides into two branches anterior ethmoidal nerve and posterior ethmoidal nerve so if you see the nasociliary nerve branches into two anterior and posterior ethmoidal nerves and also the infratrochlear nerve so this goes and innervates the lacrimal sac the inner canthus and the lateral aspect of the nose so typically whenever we are doing a dcr a dacrocystorhinostomy whether you are doing an external dcr or whether you are doing an endoscopic dcr whatever it is if you want to do a local anesthesia and if you want to operate on the lacrimal sac in a local anesthesia you will give this nasociliary block now if the nasociliary word was there in your options that is the first thing you should choose in your diagnosis but if that was not there in your option then you can go for anterior ethmoidal nerve block why anterior ethmoidal nerve block so we know nasociliary nerve gives rise to two branches the anterior ethmoidal nerve and the posterior ethmoidal nerve the anterior ethmoidal nerve which is a continuation of the nasociliary nerve passes through the anterior ethmoidal foramen so this is number one your anterior ethmoidal foramen this is number to your posterior ethmoidal foramen and the structure that you see behind number three is your optic canal now all of this is seen on the medial wall of the orbit so when I'm doing an injection on the medial wall of the orbit am I targeting specifically only the anterior ethmoidal nerve no I'm targeting anterior posterior ethmoidal nerve both of them which are branches of the nasociliary nerve so if nasociliary option is there please choose nasociliary if that option is not there then you can choose anterior ethmoidal nerve block so typically the technique is you pass the needle near the medial canthus at an angle of 45 degrees and go about two centimeters deep and then inject about two percent lidocaine over there and that will anesthetize the anterior posterior ethmoidal nerve and the nasociliary nerve and help you in giving the anesthesia that you need for your doing your lacrimal sac procedures so i think this is very clear now so if you have nasociliary in the option that will be your answer in the 2020 they didn't have this nasociliary which is when the answer was anterior ethmoidal nerve block so this is how the examiner will mince twist and give you options you have to be really intelligent to choose the right answer okay so now that you finished now let's go to a question where there was a lot of confusion and a lot of discussion among students so we will go and do this question a little bit in detail so they said you a 14 year old female presence to the ENT OPD that she can understand the language so what is happening the language is understandable and she can hear the sound but understanding the meaning is not there but unable to understand the meaning her pure tone audiometry and ABR is normal so if as if my uh, recall is right pure tone audiometry was normal and ABR was abnormal so PTA was normal and ABR and they said that SERA so SERA is a type of ABR where we take cortical evoked response potential so SERA so ABR or SERA we can say that was abnormal what is the likely diagnosis of this patient malingering vernix aphasia or auditory neuropathy otosclerosis or michael's aplasia now amongst the option there were different things that was given to me some students mentioned it was not just otosclerosis ma'am some said cochlear otosclerosis some students said ma'am there was transcortical deafness some students said there was a primary auditory cortex problem so i am not sure what were the options but i can give you an answer for this 
okay so i can give you an answer to what is this question a little bit in detail with the information that we have in hand so first of all if we think that the patient is malingering okay so if the patient is malingering why will the pta be normal abhi i am trying to malinger i am trying to show that i am deaf why will i give response on an audiometry and why will my audiometry be normal right if they give, it is a subjective test pure tone audiometry is a subjective test so any sound stimulus given to me and if i am malingering i will not give any response even to the highest decibel sound given to me because i want to malinger so pta cannot be normal right so that is ruled out okay so patient malingering pta cannot be normal okay so this is something that you are going to rule out now the second thing if patient was malingering what would happen to bera or the cortical evoked response potentials since the patient is normal and the patient is feigning or he is simply malingering or he is simply telling he's become deaf doesn't mean there is an actual deafness so when you do a abr an auditory brain stem response or a cortical evoked response potentials they will have to be normal right kyunki sab auditory pathway normal hai everything in the conduction is normal but patient is malingering so bera and sera will be normal but that's not the case here bera and sera are abnormal so malingering option is ruled out correct now we are left with the next three options so first option ruled out i hope this is clear to everybody why this is not malingering bera should have been normal or sera should have been normal and pta should have been abnormal dono bhi nahi tha question mein so that is why we are ruling out malingering abhi otosclerosis or cochlear otosclerosis now simple otosclerosis if we take stepedial type of otosclerosis the picture will be that of a conductive hearing loss so patient will be having conductive hearing loss gradually progressive paraacusis will say short sign 20 to 40 years following pregnancy all these hints would have been given in your question which is not given in this case so stepedial otosclerosis is ruled out now coming to cochlear otosclerosis if i even take take this as a cochlear otosclerosis as my option or my answer can this affect 14 year possibility is yes but a rare possibility not a common possibility the second thing if it was a cochlear otosclerosis the patient will present to you with sensory neural hearing loss right so there will be snhl so if there is an snhl can pta be normal can that be a possibility no PTA cannot be normal if there is an SNHL. PTA will surely show you SNHL. And can Bera be abnormal? Yes. In cochlear otosclerosis, Bera can be abnormal because the conduction component from the cochlea to the retrocochlear pathway is not happening because of the cochlear pathology. So Bera can be abnormal in cochlear otosclerosis. But can PTA be normal? No. The second point why it can't be cochlear otosclerosis is they are telling to you very clearly that there is problem with comprehension unable to understand the meaning the patient can hear but meaning is of getting affected so what is getting affected essentially comprehension part is getting affected where the patient is not able to understand the meaning of the sound so we will take out cochlear otosclerosis out because pta can't be normal and meaning is i mean uh, understanding the comprehension is not a function of cochlea the cochlea's function is only frequency determination but whereas discrimination of the sound understanding the sound understanding the directions of the sound coming from is all the function of the higher auditory pathway it has nothing to do with cochlea so we will rule out cochlear otosclerosis now we have michael's aplasia so what happens in michael michael's aplasia there is complete non development of the cochlea so there is complete there is no development of the cochlea at all so when there is no cochlea can the patient hear no can the patient develop speech no correct so patient would present to you in the early part in 3 years 2 years 4 years 5 years then that age group not at 14 years of age the patient would not have developed speech the patient would not have a developed language pta would definitely be abnormal so this also is ruled out so even by ruling out can we get to the answer in this question 
yes the vernix aphasia or auditory neuropathy are disorders of the higher auditory centers so here whenever there is a pathology of the higher auditory centers if we see in vernix aphasia the comprehension gets impaired okay the speech or the fluency of the speech is preserved because the broca's area is preserved so if you see this is your vernix area and this is your broca's area between the vernix and broca's area we have got the arcuate fasciculus so whenever a sound comes it goes from the primary auditory cortex which is in the superior temporal gyrus to the vernix area where the reception happens and from there it goes to the broca's area correct so here when there is a vernix aphasia problem the reception of the sound or understanding ability of the sound gets affected but since the broca's area is working well they will still be able to speak so speech is preserved or fluency of speech is preserved but is it a relevant speech or irrelevant speech you have asked one question they are giving different answer so that is what happens in broca's aphasia where the comprehension is preserved but the speech or fluency is decreased in vernix aphasia the comprehension is getting affected but the speech is preserved so i hope you got the difference so if we take vernix aphasia that can be one of the answer auditory neuropathy is another condition which affects even in a childhood even during infancy even during adulthood so when there is a neuropathy auditory neuropathy again they have difficulty in understanding the speech or the spoken words and the comprehension can get affected so with this information we know that it could be vernix it could be uh, auditory neuropathy or it can be you know transcortical aphasia sensory transcortical aphasia where the comprehension is impaired now what option was the last option that i have no idea but this is what were the options given to me by the students and i and i think that vernix or transcortical or auditory neuropathy should have been the right answer okay so i think with this you got an insight of the questions asked for you in the examination and uh, you understood a little bit about uh, the recall if you see the five questions which we had four were direct repeats this is the one question that required you to little bit rule out and get to the answer so i think ent was not a very difficult question it was a pretty simple question and i hope all of you have done really well so again wishing you all the best for your results and hoping that all of you are doing really well and and uh, hoping that i will see you all again in my unacademy classes i'll take your leave for now and see you in bye bye